Good morning, and uh, welcome to worship this morning uh, to everyone watching at home um, or who will be uh, watching it later on. I wish you a special greeting, um, and I hope you find uh, your worship today to be edifying. Um, wasn't really given any announcements to to with any specific instructions to give. Um, do you have any announcements? Okay. Well, in that case, um, I hope you enjoy your worship this morning, or ev or afternoon, evening, or night, so whenever you you happen to be watching this. And let us take some time to focus our hearts and minds as we listen to the prelude. Let us uh, now join in our uh, invitation to worship from Psalm 77, 16 to 19. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. They, the very deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies thundered. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, your path through the mighty waters, yet your footprints were unseen. Let us now join together in our opening hymn, number 716, Pray for the Wilderness.
Let us pray. Creating God, we praise you for your word, which called the universe into being, and for your spirit, which breathed life into your human creation, made in your image. We praise you that in your love you seek to embrace us in our brokenness, that while your only son was handed over to death, you raised him to life, a new creation by which you recreate each of us as we believe in hope and accept in faith. Source of life, word of life, breath of life, we worship you when we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Today we are dedicating our lovely prayer shawls, which we see here in the middle and have been crocheted or knitted by people in our community of faith. Let us pray. God of love and comfort, today we celebrate a new ministry here at St. Giles. We give thanks for the opportunity, out of love and out of concern for our Christian brothers and sisters, to share a tangible gift to those in need, our prayer shawls. While we know you are always present in our lives and that your love transcends all tragedy, illness, and pain, we also know that sometimes a physical reminder can bring hope, healing, and peace to someone who is crying out. We pray that these prayer shawls bring comfort to those who will receive them. O oh God, open our eyes so that we might see, open our ears so that we might hear, and open our minds so that we might know who needs your healing power and presence. Open our hearts so that we, we might reach out to them. Amen. Without even knowing who would receive these, these shawls were made specifically for the person who would receive them. May they see the intricate love and care given to these shawls, mirror, mirroring the intricate love and care that God bestows on all people. These shawls were made to bring warmth to someone who may feel a chill. May they feel the warm breath of the Holy Spirit as they wrap themselves with it. These shawls were made to bring comfort to someone who feels alone. May they feel comfort in knowing that someone prayed for them as they pieced them together. These shawls were made to bring peace to someone in need of prayer. May they feel the power of our prayers as they feel the yarn winding through their fingers. These shawls were made to remind the recipients that they are part of this community. May they feel touched by our love, moved by our guidance, and held up by our support. Let us pray a prayer of blessing. God of creation, redemption, and sustaining grace, we praise you for the opportunity to take part in this ministry so that we might see a world beyond ours. We thank you for putting those in need on our hearts and in our minds so that we might fully live out your call to love and serve. We ask that you bless these shawls and those who will receive them. May they feel the love, comfort, and peace of your presence. And may your light shine in them and be a beacon of the hope that is promised to all of us. Amen. We pray and we hope that if you receive one of these lovely shawls, know that prayer went into them just as much as time and yarn. I wonder, I wonder how many of you like tuna fish sandwiches? Ruth, how about you? Yeah. Three out of four like tuna fish sandwiches. Not so much this girl. <laughs> but I wonder, why do we call them tuna fish sandwiches? 
why not just tuna sandwiches? I mean, we don't say salmon fish sandwiches. We just say salmon sandwiches. That's just where my mind goes. The second thing I wondered is, now, those who are of the younger persuasion may not remember this, but how many of you, and put it in the comments, please, remember Charlie the Tuna? Back in the 60s or 70s, maybe even the 80s, he was a fixture on cartoon, cartoon commercials. Charlie the Tuna imploring us to eat tuna because it was the chicken of the sea, or maybe I'm mixing up my commercials. Tuna. It is pretty delicious, I'm told. Not a fan. But I wonder how many of us think about what goes into getting the tuna in the can and what happens in our world, in our oceans. I know that sometimes we might think that tuna are these little fish that go into the can, but I wonder if you know that they can be hundreds of kilograms in weight. They're huge. Today during our message, you're going to hear a little bit about tuna. Let's sing God of the Sparrow, God of the Whale. Today's scripture readings uh, come from the book of Genesis, chapter 1, 20 to 31, and from Job 38, 2 to 11. Genesis 1, 20 to 31. And God said, Let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters, and every living creature that moves of every kind, with which the waters swarm, and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there is evening, and there is morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things, and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, 
according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there is evening and there is morning, the sixth day. Now, Job, Job, chapter, Job chapter 38, verses 2 to 11. God speaks out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you, and you shall declare to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? Or what, on what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band? and prescribed bounds for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no farther, and here shall your proud ways be stopped. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good to see Matt here this morning. Over the last three weeks, we have been talking about the environment and ecology and being responsible stewards of the earth that God has given into our care. We talked about the simple things that we can do to make a difference in our world and, and the creatures in it. God who made the earth was our first week, and we talked about simple measures to reduce pollution and combat climate change. Second week was last week, and we talked about God who made the sky. And we talked about simple measures we can take to care for those humans, primarily children, who are susceptible to malaria. This week, it is God who made the sea, and we are going to talk about sustainability. Just as I mentioned last week that I looked to find out just as there was an Earth Day, I found out there was a World Malaria Day. So I looked, and guess what today is? It's World Tuna Day. Isn't that fortuitous? See, tuna, get it, right? So let's talk tuna. Canned tuna has been a great ally during this pandemic. It is protein that we can have on our shelves. It's sustainable, it's inexpensive, and its sales have increased exponentially during the course of COVID-19. As a result, these fish are threatened by this overwhelming demand. This isn't just this last year, but it is certainly pointed to the problem. According to the latest data, among the seven principal tuna species, over 33% of the stocks are estimated to be have, being fished at biologically unsustainable levels. As a result of overfishing, some tuna species, such as the southern bluefish tuna, is on the point of extinction. So that's why in December 2016, the United Nations General Assembly voted to officially observe World Tuna Day 
on May 2nd, which is today. But that's okay. There's plenty of fish in the sea, as the saying goes, meaning that there's an abundance of supply. But that might not be quite true. According to a study reported in the National Geographic, if we don't do something about it, by 2048, there will be no more seafood in our oceans. Did you hear that? 2048, folks. That's a pretty grim prediction, and it is not that far away. So what's happening to the fish? Well, according to a website entitled The World Counts, population and technology happened. There is an ever-growing demand from an ever-growing population that has resulted in overfishing, not, not just of tuna, but all seafood. Here's, here's a few facts on overfishing. The growing population's demands, along with boats that can stay out longer in the sea, boats that are, in essence, floating factories, that can catch and process the fish starts overfishing. Since the size of their catch has been dwindling over the years, fishing fleets have resulted in casting out bigger and bigger nets. And these nets are absolutely indiscriminate. They will be fishing for prawns and they will catch for every one ton of prawns caught Three million tons of smaller fish are caught in the nets and are thrown away, absolutely wasted. These huge trawling nets, you have to imagine that they could trap 12 Boeing 747 planes. That's how big they are. That's how much food we're wasting. And the ocean is unable to renew what we are consuming or throwing away fast enough. Add to that is the disappearance of big fish, the whales, sharks, the, the tuna, king mackerel, dolphins and marlins are disappearing or have already disappeared in many cases. In the last 55 years, we have wiped out 90% of the ocean's large fish, causing this huge disruption in the marine ecosystem. And after the big fish, like the tuna, are gone, commercial fishermen will just go down the food chain until we have depleted everything. And then, and then there's bottom trawling. It's the aquatic equivalent of deforestation. Boats cast huge and heavy nets that are held open by doors that weigh several tons, and then they just drag them along the ocean floor, catching anything and everything. Just imagine the devastation that that causes. Climate change, well, that's had an effect as well. The increase in sea temperature is well documented, and it's on the rise. I was watching a documentary just this week on Greta Thunberg, and several clients, climate scientists were on there, and they shared the information that if the world's oceans increase in temperature by just one and a half degrees, and trust me, we're going in the wrong way, by one and a half degrees, then 90% of the world's coral reefs will be decimated. These coral reefs where microorganisms begin life that feed small fish, that feed bigger fish, where the life cycle of our, life cycle of our oceans begins, they'll be gone, 90%. But, but more than that, if the sea temperatures increase by more than two, two degrees, then 99% of our coral will be eradicated. God who made the sea gave it to us to care for. And I think we can agree that maybe we haven't been doing a very good job of it. 
Carl F. Henry, who is an American Christian theologian, once offered this wise observation. Scripture does not set forth specific lines of ecological action, which may vary with time and place, but it does adduce, or offer, fixed principles that indicate that God was not content to create a chaotic wasteland, but rather a habitable universe, and that he expects his designated stewards to maintain it that way. So the scriptures don't lay out specific guidelines on how we are to protect our planet, but the implication is there, that if we are to be its rulers, if we are to have dominion, as it says in Genesis, we are to be benevolent rulers. If we are to be stewards of God's creation, then we need to be responsible stewards. So you might say, why? Why? Why should we care? Why should we do anything? Why should we care about the earth? Because it's not ours. It never was. It never will be. Our passage from Job says this, Where were you when I laid the ocean's foundations? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off the earth's dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? Who, on what were its footing set, or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Who shut up the sea behind doors and when it burst forth from the moon when I made the clouds its garments? The world is God's, not ours. God's earth, God's creation. We, we are merely tenants. And while some of us might have a longer lease than others, ultimately it will go to the next tenants, our children, and our children's children. And when it does, will we be, will we be proud of what we are giving to them, what we are leaving to them? The stats that I shared tell us that by the time our children's children become adults, little Eli, We could live in a world that has empty oceans. This world is our home. Think about it. Think about your home. If you knew that a home that you were living in was where your children would live in all their lives and their children would live in all their lives, would it make a difference how you treated your home? If you knew that you were responsible for your home, not just while you occupied it, would you take better care of it? What we are doing now affects the generations to come. Not this one, not the next one, but the next one and the next one after that. Most of us are willing to do whatever it takes to ensure the safety of our children and our grandchildren but are we willing to change how we live? Jesus reminds us to be careful with what we are given in Luke 16. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. So if you have not been faithful in the righteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches And if you have not been faithful in what belongs to someone else, who will give you what is your own? We have been entrusted with the greatest riches that God has to offer. God's world for our children and our grandchildren, it belongs to someone else, not to us. We have to look at how God cares for creation and work toward having the same goals and the same limits. If we want to work with God for the care of this planet rather than against God, we must choose to observe the limits that God sets rather than realizing that everything is possible in creation. Everything is ours. All good work respects God's limits. The art 
of living as God's caretakers requires learning to discern where the limits set by God are. And it's evident in creation. There are limits to the earth's capacity. That should be abundantly clear to us. The evidence is so obvious. So we have to learn how to be sustainable. We have to learn how to practice sustainability. The world's fish stocks are depleting, but we can do something about it if we really want to. It may take several years, and for some species, it may take centuries, but the important thing is to give them enough time to replenish. So what can you do to help? What can we do to change things? We can do our part by watching what we eat and by help spreading awareness. Know your seafood. Pick the ones that are not endangered. Look for the dolphin safe label. Not just dolphin friendly, dolphin safe. There's a difference. It's awarded by the Island, Earth Island Institute and they have the strictest sense of monitoring. Look at where your seafood is coming from. According to Pew Charitable Trusts, which is an independent, non-profit, non-governmental organization, Japan, China, the US, Indonesia, Chinese Taipei, and South Korea are responsible for 80% 111 million metric tons in 2011 of catching tuna. Back to tuna again. But these shameful six, as they are called, they are on a shame list of countries responsible for overfishing of tuna in the Pacific. But they are also some of the worst culprits in overfishing the world over. So what can we do? We can email our member of parliament about overfishing. Governments, yes, are closely monitoring the fishing industry and banning illegal fishing of endangered fish, but the government of Canada has been lax about prosecuting those boats caught overfishing or using illegal fishing practices in Canadian waters. Add to that, do you know that there is no legal requirement in Canada that quotas for fishing be set at levels recommended by science to ensure the long-term sustainability of our fish stocks? This week in my newsletter, I will include a short letter that you can email to your member of parliament or mail as well we could look at reducing our plastic waste. It's a main contributor to ocean pollution, which of course are endangering our fish stocks, all sea creatures. 90%, 90% of all ocean waste, about 20 billion tons of it every year, stays in coastal waters where it poisons breeding grounds, disrupts sea creatures and their habitats and life cycles, also contributes to the warming of our oceans. We need to be sharing this information. We need to be telling people, let your voice be heard, post the facts on Facebook, tweet about it. One person telling one person can make a difference in our world, small things, each of us can do, can make a difference in God's creation, the world that he called us to care for. Making a difference starts with us today because 2048 is just around the corner. What will we leave for our children and our children's children? Our special music today is, Oh, the Deep Love of Jesus. I invite you to sit back and enjoy this wonderful ministry of music.
was beautiful. I will post that on our Facebook page as well so that you can come back and watch it again and again. Let us bring our hearts together in prayer. God who created all things, who created us, breathing your spirit's life into us and imploring us to fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over it, be good stewards of it. Lord, we ask your forgiveness as over the centuries we have not done this. In this last century, we have done so much to decimate what you have given to us with such tender care. We ask your forgiveness. We also ask for your courage to do what is right for our children and our children's children. To do what is right for this planet that you have given to us do what is right because it does not belong to us. Lord, we take time in these moments of prayer. They're called the prayers of the people. We pray because we care. We care for this planet. We care for creation. We care for each child. We care for our family of faith. Today we pray especially for Marge and Marna as they continue to have health issues. We pray for others in our hearts and in our minds as we take a few moments in silence to pray for those that need your tender care. Breathe on us, breath of God. Fill us with life anew, so that we would love as thou dost love, and do what thou wouldst do. Amen. Our offering is given with overflowing hearts, generous hearts. They are coming to us in a myriad of ways but all for the same purpose, to share God's love with creation, with our world. Let us sing together, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. We are blessed to be a blessing. Use us in your service, we pray. Amen. Our final hymn today, and I invite you to sing it loud. I'm sure it's one that you know and love. This is my Father's world.
into the world from this time of worship to make a difference. To make a difference in God's creation, one person at a time. Know that the grace and courage that God has to offer you is yours. Know that the love of Jesus Christ is yours. And may the peace of the Holy Spirit fill you this day. Flow through your week, flow through you to people, and know that you are blessed. Be safe, be well, you are beloved. Amen. Amen.